Okay, Psalm 101, a psalm of David. I will sing of mercy and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever sl secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evil evildoers from the city of the Lord. Our sermon today is Exodus 21, 28 through 36. It's entitled, The Price of a Life. Um, verse 28, If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. But if the ox tended to thrust with its horn in times past, and it has been made known to his owner, and he has not kept it confined so that it has killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner shall also be put to death. If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life, whatever is imposed on him. Whether it has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this judgment, it shall be done to him. If the ox gores a male or a female servant, he shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. And if a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to the owner, but the dead animal shall be his. If one man's ox hurts another's so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money from it, and the dead ox they shall also divide. Or if it was known that the ox tended to thrust in time past, and its owner is not kept to confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall be his own. Those last two verses, as I said, make a perfect picture of what the Lord is going to do in redemptive history. I'm going to read them to you again, and I want you to think about this. If one man's ox hurts another's so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money from it, and the dead ox they shall also divide. Or if it was known that the ox tended the thrust in times past, and its owner has not kept it confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall be his own. What does a passage about oxen goring people, animals falling into pits, and oxen causing the death of another oxen have to do with Christ Jesus? Well, in one way or another, it all points to him, doesn't it? We have the finer points of the law, which show us how burdensome the law really is. We have things that are expected of us, and when we fail at them, we are held accountable for our actions. We have valuations which are set according to animals and people, free men and slaves. There are so many little points to consider. In the end, and if nothing else, the law continues to show us that even things which we do wrong and which may not even be intentional can still bring guilt upon us. When this happens, we may have to make restitution or we may even forfeit our lives. A truth concerning Adam Sin and death is actually seen in the last few verses of chapter 21 today. They are verses about an ox which causes the death of another ox, and yet they reveal a truth that Paul writes about 1,500 years later. Here's our text verse for today from Romans 5, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. How can it be that an owner's responsibility concerning the death of another person's ox have anything to do with Adam, the law, and Jesus? 
The answer is that even seemingly obscure passages about normal physical life still contain spiritual truths. This is the wonder and the marvel of the Bible. It is a story which reveals the very heart of God towards his creatures, and it's all to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. Our first thought today is a reckoning for the lifeblood of man. It's verses 28 through 32. The final portion of Exodus 21 deals with laws in relation to animals which are owned and to which responsibility is connected. Some of this will deal with the animals owned by an individual which causes harm to another. And some will deal with harm which has come to an animal owned by another. The animal is man's property and often his livelihood. And so laws needed to be given in order to ensure that the rights of property as well as the rights of those who interact with it are maintained. Verse 28, if an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned. In this passage, we're given a fuller insight into the sanctity of human life than that first defined in Genesis 9, verse 5. In Genesis 8, after the flood, Noah built an altar and sacrificed to the Lord. The Bible makes no note of wrongdoing on Noah's part, and in fact, the opposite is true. Upon making his offering, we next read this. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer and day and night shall not cease. The fact that an animal had its life taken from it was acceptable to the Lord. After that note, the focus was on man and on the grace that the Lord would bestow upon him. Immediately after this came the first words of chapter 9, which say, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. Concerning animals, several things of note are seen. First, there will be a marked difference in how the animals responded to man. Fear and dread of man would be upon them. The implication is that this was not the case before the flood. Secondly, the animals of the earth were, at this time, given into the hand of man. The verse is very clear that in every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Animals are given into man's hand for his benefit. The life of the animal is wholly at the discretion and the taste of man. Chinese continue to fulfill this precept absolutely. They have a saying, if it flies in the sky, if it walks or crawls on the earth, or if it swims in the ocean, we will eat it. At this point in time, no distinction was made between what could be eaten and what was forbidden. If the man was hungry and the animal looked nummy, then the animal was ready for the oven. Although this is a side issue, not pertaining to the verses that we're looking at, it needs to be addressed from time to time. The only dietary restrictions concerning animals are those which belong to the law of Moses. For this reason, two things are to be inferred from this. First, only the Israelite nation and only until the fulfilling of the law in Christ were these restrictions in force. And secondly, the eating of meat, meaning any kind of meat, is both acceptable and approved of by God. If someone wants to only eat vegetables, that is their prerogative. However, no person should ever be placed under such a dietary restriction by a religious edict. Such a tenet is contrary to the Bible and it usurps what God has allowed. It isn't just bad doctrine. It is heretical to so force such a tenet on others. Reinserting the law or adding a precept not commanded by God is to be utterly rejected. With that issue out of the way, we can return to the principal line of thought here. The animal is in a different category than man and is given for the benefit of man. If an animal were to cause the death of a person, then its life is forfeit. This is first seen in Genesis 9, verse 5. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. 
The words of this first verse today are given to further define what those words meant. In this, the ox is taken as the prime example for us to consider, probably because it was a very common animal and because it would not be unusual for an ox to so gore a person. The ox then stands for any animal that would bring death to a person, and the horns are to be taken in place of any other way that an animal could kill a man, by teeth, by stomping, or whatever else caused a man to die. The verb for gores here is nagach. It's the first of 11 uses of it in the Bible. It means to butt with the horns. But figuratively, it is also used to mean to war against. It's used in this way in 1 Kings chapter 22 with these words. Now Zedekiah, the son of Hena'ana, had made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. The act of goring there was a metaphor for defeating the enemy in battle until they were finished off. In the case of an ox goring a person to death, then that animal was to die the death of a murderer, the penalty of which was stoning. As it says, Sakol Yisakel Hashur, stoning, you shall stone the ox. Verse 28 continues, and its flesh shall not be eaten. There are several suggestions as to why these words have been given. The first is that it is laden with the guilt of murder, according to Kyle and Delich. The second is that the animal would not have been bled in the usual way, and that would be unclean food for the Hebrews, according to Charles Ellicott. A third is that he has become the symbol of a homicide and so the victim of a curse, a harem. That's John Lang. The third is certainly correct. Although the animal was laden with the guilt of murder, that doesn't fully explain why it wasn't to be eaten. And the fact that it hadn't been bled in the usual way only prohibited those of Israel from partaking in it. These two options are both refuted by verses 34 and 35. If it were simply a matter of meat, then the dead animal could be sold to a non-Israelite. Rather, the animal has been placed under the ban of harem, or a thing devoted to God for destruction. This then explains the words of Genesis 9, verse 5. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. Verse 28 going on, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. It's the natural instinct of an ox to hook with its horns. Because of this, it would be impossible to foresee every time that this would happen. And so it would be impossible to prevent it from happening. It would be unjust to hold the owner responsible for his ox's actions if it had no record of previously harming others, or if there were negligence on the part of another person who should have known better than to get too close to an ox or irritate it or whatever else. In such a case, the person was to be released from the guilt and considered blameless in the matter. However, if the circumstances were different, then the outcome would also be different. Verse 29, but if the ox tended the thrust with its horn in times past, and it has been made known to its owner, and he has not kept it confined so that it has killed a man or a woman, the term in times past here is mitamol shilshom, or literally, from yesterday to the third. It is an idiom which means in times past, as it is rightly translated. Unfortunately, the rabbis left the obvious use of the term, and they invented this abusive system of legalities in regards to this command of the Lord. John Gill explains it for us. Concerning this testimony, Maimonides, who is a famous Jewish rabbi, thus writes, this is a testification. All that testify of it three days. But if he pushes or bites or kicks or strikes even a hundred times on one day, this is no testification, not a sufficient one. Three companies of witnesses testify of it in one day, lo, this is a doubt whether it is a proper testimony or not. There is no testification but before the owner and before the Sanhedrin. In other words, the obvious nature of the intent of this verse was discarded and in its place came a convoluted set of rules and exceptions. This is exactly what Jesus warned against concerning their mishandling of the law. The verse is clear on its surface. The verb for gores here of the previous verse is exchanged for the adjective form, nagach. It is only used twice in the Bible, here and then again in verse 36. It reflects a sentiment that the ox was prone to goring, 
but it was left unrestrained, despite the owner's knowledge of it. This would be comparable to someone having a very dangerous pit bull who had been known to attack in times past, and yet it was allowed to roam around freely. In such a case, the owner is guilty for whatever harm the pit bull causes. In the case of the bull and its resulting death, it would pertain to a free man and not to a slave. In the case of the death of a slave, latter verses that we're going to look at today in this section will provide more direction. Verse 29 continues, The ox shall be stoned, and its owner shall also be put to death. These words further define both the demand upon the animal and the demand upon the man who owns the animal, which was originally given in Genesis 9 verse 5. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. There is a difference in the punishment though. It only says that the ox was to be stoned as the ox is the principal in the murder. However, the means of execution of the man is not specified. It only says that he shall be put to death. So they may have a more you know, merciful way of putting him to death than the brutality of stoning. This law of the animal though is not unique to Israel. Several scholars comment on various practices which are comparable to this law given by Moses. A guy named Pausanias is said to have noted two cases where statues actually caused the death of people. I don't know if it fell on them or what, but one was cast into the sea and the other was ceremonially purified. Plato would have an animal or even an inanimate object which had killed a man tried, actually in a court of law. If guilt was found, they were to be expelled from the country. In the case of the animal, it was first to be slain and then expelled. Whatever good that would do, I don't know, but that was what he wanted. In Rome, it is said that hay was twisted around the horns of any dangerous cattle so that the people could see it and be cautious to not approach that animal. And finally, the scholars at Cambridge note that in medieval Europe, animals charged with causing a death were often tried in a court of law, and if found guilty, they were killed. They note that a cow was executed in this manner in France in the year 1740. I mean, this is really recent history. It appears that the substance of the words of Genesis 9 verse 5 have continued to be remembered by nations around the world long after they were spoken to Noah. The general concept continues to be held to in the modern world today, but unfortunately, there are those who would prefer saving the life of such an animal even after the loss of human life. When we learn to place the value of animal life above that of human life, we upturn the mandates of God and we show both disrespect towards him directly by acting against his word and indirectly by disregarding the rights of his image bearers. Verse 30, if there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life, whatever is imposed on him. In the case of being the owner of a bull, which is known to be aggressive and which took the life of another person, a ransom for his life could be made. This verse records the only time in the law of Moses where a covering could be made for a capital offense. This then was both an allowance of mercy for the family of the person who was killed and a way for them to be recompensed for their great loss. Rather than demand the offender's death, they could impose on him a sum, a ransom. The word here is kofar, and it has a very wide range of meanings which are all interrelated. It can mean bribe, pitch, ransom, satisfaction, sum of money, village, and even die, known as henna. All of the words carry the same connotation of covering. If you live in a village, you live in a covered area. If you use pitch, as Noah did, you use it to cover the leaky spots of a vessel. If you use henna, you cover your skin like a tattoo. And if you pay a ransom, you cover over an offense in the eyes of the offended with the exchange of the money. This word, kofer, comes from the verb kafar, which means to appease or to atone. And this is exactly what is implied in such a ransom, a covering in order to atone for wrongdoing. Understanding these unusual connections between the various words and their uses opens up a great deal of understanding in why such words are used throughout the Bible. And so we go right from kofer or sum of money to the words which the New King James Version translates as to redeem his life. This is translated from the noun pidyom. 
This is the first of three times it's going to be used in the Bible, and it comes from the word pada, which means to ransom. As it is a noun, the New King James Version gets a demerit in their translation. It should say something like, for a ransom of his life, rather than to redeem his life. Though the final meaning is understood in both, it is more in line with the original to call it a ransom for his life, as the exchange is being made between the two, the sum and the life. And that exchange is whatever is imposed on him. Now, many scholars insert here, and I mean a lot of scholars insert, that the sum was up to the judges to decide. For example, Ellicott says the fine was imposed primarily by the aggrieved relatives, but in cases of an exorbitant demand, there was no doubt an appeal to the judges who would then fix the amount. This is why I tell people never to believe commentaries when you read them. That is completely incorrect. The family of the dead person had the right of the avenger of blood. Thus, they also had the right of granting mercy. The man's life is already forfeit, and so there is every reason to assume that any amount, even up to all of his possessions, could be demanded. If the man had his own family, he would then have to decide, is my life worth my family's inheritance? Is it worth the poverty of my wife and my children? This is certainly the case. One of only two other times that this word pidyom is found in the Bible is in the 49th Psalm. There it is again used in connection with the word nefesh, or soul. Here's what it says there. Why should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. And then here's the word pidyom. For the red redemption of their souls is costly, and it, it, it shall cease forever that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. Even Jesus in the New Testament raises the issue in a very similar way. Though it is referring to a spiritual matter, the idea of making an exchange for one's soul or life force still applies. Here's what he says. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man gain in exchange for his soul? The choice for a man of Israel to continue to be redeemed from the grave before he dies, or the choice for a man to be redeemed from the grave after death, both carry the thought of a very high cost. And so the question is, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Verse 31, whether it has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this judgment, it shall be done to him. It is amazing to read the varied opinions on why this verse is added. One scholar says that this was added in order to show that a lesser value for the redemption is implied because their use. That has nothing to do with it. The verse is given between the verse concerning a man and a woman and that of slaves to show that a free person, even a son or a daughter, has full rights and is of equal value. Neither age nor sex has any bearing on the amount of the claim. The same law is to be recognized whether a man, a woman, a son, or a daughter is killed. The life of the irresponsible owner is forfeit unless he is willing to pay whatever ransom is demanded. He cannot claim, oh, it was only a daughter and a young one at that, and so it doesn't matter. The child's life was held in the same esteem as any other. Verse 32, if the ox gores a male or a female servant, he shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. As a slave is the property of the owner, no claim could be made by the avenger of blood. Therefore, in lieu of an arbitrary fine, a standard valuation was given for the life of a slave, 30 shekels of silver. In order to justify this amount as being appropriate, Scholars will show that people who were devoted to God were given a set value according to their sex and their age in Leviticus 27. Now, I'm going to read you this, but I want you to understand in advance, this has nothing to do with it. I'm just showing you what scholars think. It says in Leviticus 27, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man consecrates by a vow certain persons to the Lord according to your valuation, if your valuation is of a male from 20 years old up to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 
50 shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If it is a female, then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. And if from five years old up to 20 years old, then your valuation for a male shall be 20 shekels and for a female, 10 shekels. And from it, a month old up to five years old, then your valuation shall for a male shall be five shekels of silver and for a female, your valuation shall be three shekels of silver. And if from 60 years old and above, if it is a male, then your valuation shall be 15 shekels and for a female, 10 shekels. I know that's a lot of verses, but this is what they're doing. They're saying that the ransom of 30 shekels is tied into what I just read you and it has nothing to do with it, okay? Uh, their idea is that the highest value considered was that of a male from 20 to 60 years, which is 50 shekels. Therefore, valuing a slave at 30 shekels was not undervaluing the life of a slave in comparison to a free person. This is not what it's speaking of. If this standard of Leviticus 27 applied as they are inferring, then there would have been a set value on the life of the people who were gored in verses 29 through 31. But there was not. Therefore, it cannot be said that Leviticus 27 is an apple-to-apple -apple comparison. It is a different context with a different purpose. There, it is a set valuation on a person devoted to the Lord as an offering. It is not the valuation of a life of a person who is a servant. The reason this is important isn't really realized until we get the account of Jesus' betrayal. It's prophesied in the book of Zechariah, and then in the book of Matthew, we read these passages concerning the price that was paid for the life of the Messiah. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. From that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Another section. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. Never mind the fact that they just sold the Messiah and broke the law doing that. But they goes on, verse 7, And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore that field had been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. The valuation for the life of a mere slave in Israel was the value which the Lord, who gave them this same law, was valued at by his betrayer. Judas probably didn't see the irony in the exchange that the chief priests did as they weighed out the silver for that servant of infinite value. That sale led directly to his death, a death as if gored by bulls and torn by lions. The 22nd Psalm describes the scene. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. It was his people who sold him to his death. And it was men portrayed as animals which tore at him as he died for them. And then concerning the same group of people who so willingly sold away their Lord for such a pittance, Adam Clark notes this. He says, and in return, the justice of God has ordered it so that they have been sold for slaves into every country of the universe. And yet, strange to tell, they see not the hand of God in so visible a retribution. Adam Clark rightly noted that they sold Christ for the price of a slave. So they were sold to be slaves among the nations exactly as the Bible prophesied. What he wasn't alive to see is that just as they were sold, 
they are now being bought back. The irony of it is that they are being redeemed by the very one whom they sold off. Isaiah gives us a beginning clue in these words of Isaiah 52. You have sold yourselves for nothing and you shall be redeemed without money. The suffering servant who was sold for a servant's wages gave his life to redeem those who sold him. The servant has become their master and those who were his masters have become his servants. For 30 pieces of silver was sold my Lord. For the price of a slave was his life taken away but the suffering servant did this to fulfill the word and to usher in for us a glorious new day. For 30 pieces of silver was he betrayed and then he was beaten and hung on a tree. But in his death, God's wrath towards me was stayed. Yes, for 30 pieces of silver, Christ died for me. Oh, that such a thing as this is true, that God allowed the hands of the wicked to purchase Jesus. For 30 pieces of silver, he redeemed me and you. Yes, for the price of a slave, God did this for us. Our second thought today is making good on one's responsibilities. It's verses 33 through 35. Verse 33, and if a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls into it, these final verses pass from the value of human life to the value of non-human property. Here in this verse, two different concepts are given. The first is if a man opens a pit that already existed, such a pit would have been kept covered for the reason that we're going to see. The second concept is that of a man digging a new pit and leaving it uncovered for some reason. Maybe he was still in the process of digging it or maybe he took his animals out to it and made them aware of where it was so that they wouldn't later fall into it. In either case, however, he is considered negligent in his action towards the animals of another person, and he becomes liable for any damages that occur, such as the loss of his ox or donkey. These two are selected surely because of their high value, but in the precept is certainly true, and it would remain true even if a less valuable animal fell in, such as a sheep or a goat. Pits were and still are used for numerous things. They may be cisterns where water comes out. This is seen in the account of Jacob arriving in Padan Aram back in Genesis 29. It said, so Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. Then he looked and saw a well in the field and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well, they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. A pit could also be used for trapping animals or for storage, such as grain. If such a pit existed and it was uncovered by someone, they were under obligation to cover it back up as a safety measure. If they failed to do so, it became their liability to make any damages right. To emphasize the value of the matter, Jesus even gave this example in the book of Matthew. Then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep? and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. The care of an animal and the cost of it to the owner made it justifiable to do even what would otherwise be considered work on the Sabbath day. It is for this reason that, verse 34, the owner of the pit shall make it good. The word for owner here is Baal. It means master or lord. And so by implication, the translators say owner. This may not be the best translation because a pit may be there for common use, such as the example of Jacob in the well in Padanaram. In this case, it might be better to think of it as the person responsible for the pit, whether he's the owner or not. It may be that one joint owner of the pit isn't the one that uncovered it. If that were the case, then it would be wrong to penalize him as responsible for someone else's negligence. Rather, it is the man who uncovers or digs the pit who is to make good on the loss. It was his responsibility when he uncovered it and then failed to cover it back up. And this extended to any location. Several scholars say that this only applied on public property. Here's how Matthew Poole states it. To wit, in a public way, as the reason of the law shows, for it was done in a man's own house or ground. There was no danger of such an accident except the beast transgressed his bounds and then the man was not culpable. Once again, when you read commentaries, take them with a grain of salt. That is wholly incorrect. 
the liability extended to the loss of the animal regardless of where it fell into a pit. A good verse to substantiate that private property still had to protect the well-being of others is found in the book of Deuteronomy. Here's what it says. When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring guilt of bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. Well, you might ask, what was somebody doing up on somebody's roof? But that is of less matter than the protection of someone on the roof. Even if houses were joined together and walking between them was a commonly accepted practice, as it is in parts of the world today, it still occurred on one's private property, just as would be the case with an animal falling into a pit. Verse 34 continues, He shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his. In such a case, the one who uncovered the pit and failed to cover it again was to pay for the loss of the animal. But the dead animal would be his as a fair exchange. This verse and the next one show that the animal which had gored a human in verse 28 was under a ban from being eaten. It wasn't because it wasn't properly bled that it couldn't be eaten, but because it was devoted to God for destruction. However, in the case of an animal that fell into a pit and died, it still had value to the owner as it could be sold to a foreigner to help recoup the loss that he faced through his own stupid negligence. This is seen here in Deuteronomy 14. You shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to an alien who is within your gates that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. So that's why I say be careful when you read commentaries because people say things and they haven't gone through the Bible to evaluate other passages which refute what they say. The meat could be sold for non-Israelite food and the skin could be sold to a tanner for leather or maybe for a donkey blanket or whatever else that such a hide could be used for. As you can see, even though he had to bear the penalty for his negligence, he was still given a sort of grace in the process. Verse 35, if one man's ox hurts another's so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money from it. This here is an especially fine point within the law. One ox has hurt another and death has resulted. This is the natural order of things, and there's nothing offensive or repulsive about that animal. It could even be that the two animals were sparring over some lovely female as oxen do. In this case, though, the animal is to be sold, not kept. What this implies is that there is now a stain on the ox, and it has to be replaced with another which has no fault in it. Listen carefully. And isn't that a beautiful picture of Christ Jesus replacing Adam? There was guilt in Adam, and so he had to be replaced with another which bore no guilt. The money was to be divided between the owners, and then they were to do with it as they wished. If they wanted a new ox, they could use the silver from the defective one towards another. Likewise, they were to take action concerning the dead ox. Verse 35 continues, And the dead ox they shall also divide. When we started today, I mentioned the value of animals in regards to humans. This is another verse which shows us that precept. When an ox scores a human and the human dies, it was to be stoned and not eaten. Nothing was mentioned about selling it or dividing it or anything else. It was simply to be stoned and that was that. It received a murderer's penalty. It bore the blood guilt of man. This makes a great spiritual picture, which is later explained in 1 John chapter 3. Listen to this. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. However, when an ox were to cause the death of another ox, then the live ox was to be sold and the money for it was to be divided between the two. Along with that, the dead ox was to be divided. Again, the dead animal still had value, even if an Israelite couldn't eat it. The proceeds from the dead would help to make up the difference towards buying a new ox. If you think about it, this is a marvelous picture of what is going on in the world. 
there is the devil who became the owner of this world. All men were under his power. All men. There is death in Adam, but life also comes through Adam in the sense that Christ came from Adam. The division of the dead ox shows us this. The dead ox is Adam and his offspring. But because Jesus is a son of Adam, life came from death, pictured by the purchase of a new unstained ox. The proceeds came from both the live stained ox and from the dead ox. It is the dual nature of man, physically alive and yet stained and spiritually dead. Christ, the replacement, is both alive and unstained. And so through him, we can move under his ownership. Like the oxen, there are at this time two owners of men. This is the division in the world. One side is working death for death, and one side is working death for life. The stream of Adam is divided, leading to one purpose or the other. Either man stays under the original owner and remains dead, or he moves to the new owner and is replaced with unstained life. Even in a simple passage about the oxen causing the death of another oxen, there are spiritual truths to be found. This is further defined in our final verse of the chapter and of the sermon. Verse 36, Or if it was known that the ox tended the thrust in time past, and his owner had not kept it confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall be his own. The chapter ends with this final thought concerning culpability. If the owner knew of the harm that the ox was capable of because of past events, then he became liable for the entire cost of the live ox, and only the dead ox would be his. In this it says, Shalem ye shalem, paying he shall pay. The entire burden for the matter rests on him, and yet he is allowed at least to keep the dead ox. Again, it is a point of grace in an otherwise sad state of affairs. But again, it points to a spiritual matter. It is a picture of remaining dead in one's transgressions. A person who willfully acts against what he knows will bring life remains spiritually dead. Only through active obedience of what is right can one receive what is life. This person has walked away from that and he only receives death. However, as a matter of grace, he has been given this physical life even if it is a life of spiritual death. And every person in this church was under that category at one point in their life. The proceeds from it are only death, but they are the proceeds which he is granted by the law. As was seen at the giving of the law, and as will be seen throughout the entire law, the law can save no man because no man can fulfill it. And yet, at the same time, the law is the only thing that can bring about salvation. And so Christ came under the law and fulfilled it for us. Do you see how this is working now with these oxen? It's astonishing and it's very complicated, but God has given us a picture in this last two verses of exactly what Jesus Christ did for humanity. This is what's seen in the verses today. The proceeds of the law for one who has failed to keep the law are death. But the proceeds of the law for one who has met the standards of the law are life. As we are already guilty before the law, then in order to have that life, we must yield ourselves to the one who has fulfilled it in our place. Thank God for Jesus Christ. If you've never asked him to simply forgive you of your sins and to take away the guilt that you bear, I would ask you to do it today. It's very simple. Sin came through our first father, Adam. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. Sin is what brings about death. The wages of sin is death. And because we inherited that death from our father, which we talked about during the prophecy update, we are all dead. We are the dead ox. But then you buy another unstained ox to replace it, and the proceeds from that can be imputed to us. Christ died on the cross, sinless, and therefore we can move to that perfect unstained Christ and leave our first father, Adam. It's all pictured in these two verses, but it is very important to understand that God again and again and again is trying to wake us up to our spiritual state. So if you're out there on YouTube or somebody in here has never simply said, I get it this time. I understand that I cannot receive heaven's rewards without Christ's having fulfilled it on my part. Please do it today. Jesus, I can't save myself. I want you to save me. And then I will live for you as best as I can. All right? Please do that. Please. 
Our closing verse today comes from Romans chapter 3. Listen to this. It'll help explain it. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Only through the fulfillment of the law in Christ can we get away from that. Wonderful, wonderful how the Bible just confirms itself all the way through. Book of Romans, I would suggest that if you are unsure about Christian theology, read the book of Romans and then read it again six times in a row until it sinks in. Because if you understand what Paul says in the book of Romans, all of these Old Testament pictures begin to make sense. Next week we have Exodus 22 verses 1 through 15. It's something important to relay to you. It's entitled, The Responsible Thing to Do. That'll be our 60th Exodus sermon. And as I say each week, the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. Even if a deep ocean lies ahead of you, he can part the waters and lead you through it on dry ground. So follow him and trust him, and he will do marvelous things for you and through you. All right? And I feel really convicted about Tom today because I told him to get out of here. And I know that the guy needs help, but I know what he's going to do. And I just, I, he, I've known the guy forever. And it's just on my heart right now to, uh, for us to pray for him. Everybody, when you go home, just keep Tom in prayer. Because if you were here the last time he was here, he was just causing all kinds of trouble. And I asked him, please, you need to go. And he walked out cussing and just giving me grief. And I know that's where the inevitable end is. I dealt with him on Siesta Key for years at the mall I take care of. But I'm convicted by that because maybe he would have just fallen asleep or maybe he would have heard something. I doubt it. And today's sermon was very complicated. But that guy really needs Jesus badly. So please pray for Tom. Our poem today is called The Price of a Life. If an ox scores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned as is fit. And its flesh, flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox you shall acquit. But if the ox tended to thrust with its horns in times past, and to his owner with this knowledge he has been filled, and he has not kept it confined so that it has a man or a woman killed, the ox shall be stoned as directed by me, and put to death shall its owner also be. If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay his life to redeem whatever is imposed on him, whatever is fitting as it would seem. Whether it has gored a son or gored a daughter, either one, according to this judgment to him it shall be done. If the ox scores a male or a female servant, he shall give 30 shekels of silver to their master, and the ox shall be stoned for having caused this disaster. And if a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit shall make it good as is just, proper, and fit. He shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his, not just a loner. If one man's ox hurts another's so that it dies, this to you I decide, then they shall sell the, li the live ox and the money from it divide. And the dead ox they shall divide also, such as how the affair shall go. Or if it was known that the ox tended the thrust in time past, and its owner has not kept it confined, then you shall do this at last. He shall pay ox for ox, and the dead animal shall be his own. It was he who got himself into this box." Simple laws, but which teach us of other things, pictures of Christ in his work for us. And in them, oh, how my heart sings of the marvelous wonders of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, O oh God, for this hope you have given to us. Though in Adam we are dead in our sin, through your Son we are made alive. Yes, through Jesus, a new and eternal life we have been granted to live in. Thank you. Thank you, O oh God, hear our praise that our hearts will sing to you for eternal days. Hallelujah and amen. amen. Heavenly Father, I want to lift up Tom today, and I would ask that you would open his heart to be receptive to your word. And uh, I don't know if we'll have a chance to meet up with him today or not, but I would hope that it would be soon that we could talk to him about what is right and about throwing our lives away for nothing, for, for drinking all night and then drinking all day. I would pray that you would help him to get away from that. He's got a good life and the only one that is harming him is himself. So we pray for him. We also pray for anybody that was uh, affected by this tornado last night that is uh, either suffering without their property or is suffering without a family member. 
that uh, you will be with them and give them comfort. And maybe it would be a chance for you to work through somebody to bring the message to them that they need Jesus and that there is hope in this darkened world. Lord, I thank you for this precious word you have given us, which is utterly astonishing in what it pictures. It is just a marvel to me and so exciting to see your word come alive in the way that it does. We thank you for the opportunity to take the Lord's table here and to praise you and to receive what Jesus did on the cross. And we will proclaim it again until he comes without fail. What a great God you are. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord. So in his name we pray, amen. comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, and uh, Paul wrote these words, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and he would have given thanks over it. He would have said these words, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed this as well. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGuffin. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Don't forget that there is food back here provided by the doctor and Mabel, and uh, it looks absolutely wonderful, so make sure you eat something before you leave, and uh, please pray for Tom. And Lord, we do love you, we do praise you, we exalt you, and we do pray one more time for Tom here as a congregation. And uh, forgive me if I did the wrong thing today. I, I, I just can't know, but I know where it's gone in the past, and it just it's not healthy for your congregation to be disturbed by something like that. So if I did wrong, please forgive me, and if I did the right thing, then uh, I would ask for somebody to have an opportunity to minister and to finally get it through his head after all these years. We love you and we praise you, Jesus. You are so good to us. We exalt you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>